Um, my name is Maya. I am the Canada organizer with World Beyond War, and I'm thrilled to be here with Lorelai Higgins, who I will introduce in just a few moments. Uh, before I do that, I'd like to quickly uh, invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. If you'd like to say your name, where you're calling in from, uh, that sort of thing, we'd love to hear from you. Additionally, with some quick Zoom protocols, uh, we encourage you to put any questions that you have during the webinar in the chat. Um, additionally, I wanted to point out that we are recording this webinar and we'll be sending out the recording to all participants, all registrants um, after this uh, webinar is, is complete. Um, additionally, I wanted to flag the fact that you will notice that uh, our video and audio is disabled for participants. And that's just for everyone's, uh, you know, safety and well-being to protect us from Zoom bombing and um, to make it easier to enjoy Lorelai's incredible presentation. Um, and with that, I just wanted to add one more thing, which is that if you'd like to enable captions, you can click the button that says CC Live Transcript on your Zoom control panel at the bottom of your screen. And I just wanted to mention that it is an automatic transcription done by robots, not humans, so it will include errors, um, but please do uh, enable that if that assists with your ability to enjoy this evening. I also wanted to do a, a brief land acknowledgement um, it's very important, uh, as many of us are on what we know as Canada, we must recognize and acknowledge the relationship that First Nations, Inuit, and Métis across Canada have with the land and state we benefit from as settlers. Personally, I am a settler located on the unceded territory of the Ganekahaga, the easternmost nation of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The island I'm located on is known as Jojage in Ganegeha and Muniang in Anishinaabemowin. It's been a place of cultural exchange for millennia, and I encourage other settlers to interrogate your relationship to the ongoing violent colonialism that continues across this continent. Importantly, the reality is that acknowledging this fact really means nothing on its own. Land acknowledgements can be attempts by settler colonial forces, including Canada, to absolve themselves of guilt and responsibility, while also ignoring their roles and practices and campaigns dispossessing Indigenous peoples of their lands, wealth, and culture in present day. We have responsibility to move far beyond words and into praxis. So please do take this land acknowledgement as an explicit call to action, wherever you may be, to support Indigenous resistance against colonial governments, as well as resistance against extractive industries, state violence, and ecological degradation. Do whatever you can, wherever you can, to stand in solidarity with Indigenous communities across Turtle Island. And with that being said, I am thrilled to introduce Lorelai Higgins. Lorelai Higgins is a Métis Canadian cultural mediator, Rotary Peace Fellow, Rotary Positive Peace Activator, Anti-Racism Community Lead for the City of Calgary, and Indigenous Relations Strategist. She is also Mrs. Canada Globe 2022. Laura Lai leads conflict, con, excuse me, leads conflict transformation projects globally with a focus on indigenous human rights. We are absolutely thrilled to have her here with us tonight. Thank you and welcome Laura Lai. Uh, Marcy, Maya, uh, Oki, Dani, Pada, Ambo, Stitch, Tanche. Hello, everybody. I am so happy you're here. I know I can't see any of you, but you can hopefully see me or even if your audio is just on. Um, just welcome. Thank you for making the time. I know how busy it is. And I know that we're all transitioning from hybrid to maybe still virtual and maybe to in-person. And I don't know if you feel like I feel, but I'm definitely spending a lot of my day um, logging into computers and then seeing people in person. And I feel like I have even more work than before. So to take this time and to talk about peace is amazing. And I hope that this session is filling and it leaves you um, with more questions than answers. And I'm looking forward to more dialogue from all of this. So I have a formal presentation for all of you. I'll have some slides. And what I'm really hoping for is to have some great dialogue at the end and some, some really great relationships that um, come out of this. And I know some people I know personally already online. So thank you for being here and thanks to everybody for all the support. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen and we're gonna get started.
So as Maya already said, if you thought you were coming to talk about peace building and truth and reconciliation in Canada with me and World Beyond War, you are in the right place. If you weren't intending to, please consider staying. We have some really amazing things to share. So Maya, what a wonderful acknowledgement you've given of the lands that you're on. I'm loving the chat, seeing where everybody else is. If you know the traditional names for where you live, um, use them in the chat. If you don't, go learn them. Um, where I am in my language, which is Machif, my family's Métis, um, I'm in, I'm in uh, Otesquany. And so this is the lands um, where I am. This is literally five minutes from my house. It's a stun wheel um, created by the late Andy Blackwater. Um, and this is a really special place for me. It's one of our urban indigenous gathering places. And uh, I definitely like to spend a lot of time up here. So I encourage each of you to find those places, whether you're uh, in the countryside or in the city, where you can truly connect to the land um, and get to feel some of the footprints that we're walking in. So I always start every presentation, if you've seen me present before, uh, with my grandmother. This is Delia, and she plays an important, important part in my life. She was one of um, the first in our family to actually navigate the space in between. And so as our family came over from England and met with Indigenous peoples here in Canada, um, an entire new nation was born. And in particular, my family, uh, where how I identify as Métis, was born in the Red River. So my grandmother, Delia, and we're going to come back to her at the end, she was one of the first in my family to navigate what it was like to be European, but also to be Indigenous. And she was part of the creation of a brand new nation. So that idea that we could be Indigenous and European and, and speak Indigenous languages and European ones and walk in both worlds. She was also um, one of the first generations in my family to actually navigate oppressive policies, um, to go into hiding for our culture, to hide the children, and to um, have passed on not fully getting to realize culturally who she is. And so we'll come back to that. Um, but as I mentioned, all of the things around reconciliation in Canada, I always like to bring my grandmother in one for support. <laughs> she always helps me find my words. But two, to also just remind everybody that the stories that I share are, are personal to me and to my family. So how wonderful for World Beyond War to be having this. Thank you so much, Maya. It's been incredible working with you to set this up. A shout out to Greta, who's in the background running technology. And a shout out to Phil, who actually helped get this all set up. He's a, a fellow Rotary Peace Fellow. And he helped make these connections. I know there's an entire team. Um, the website's there. I know lots of you are probably members already. Um, but I um, just wanted to give a shout out to the organization and also say the goal of establishing a just and sustainable peace is probably a lot of the reason why we're here and nonviolent movements to end war. So kudos to all of you. I don't know all the work that you do. So if you want to populate the chat with some of the cool things you're up to or follow up later, I would love to hear all the things that everybody's up to and what brought you here today. So I thought I'd start with a bit of background. Maya gave you such a wonderful introduction of me. And so I'll put some pictures to that introduction. Um, I call it my peace building incubation. And so growing up, I never really traveled anywhere. But in 1998, I finally had the chance to get on an airplane and I was a rotary exchange student in South Africa. And I truly think this was my peace building incubation. I certainly didn't have words for it, but I knew that I was working across cultures based in South Africa. I went to school there for a year and I was starting to learn different languages and learning what it took to truly work in community to create change, um, to do service projects, to do all the things that I'm currently working on today. So I spent a year there and 20 years later through Rotary as well, I had a chance to become a Rotary Peace Fellow. And um, some of you on this call may be familiar with the program, but it is one of the funded programs around the world that actually um, helps us look at peace and conflict resolution and actually look at conflict tra transformation. So I went off to Chulalongkorn in Thailand. So Maya also mentioned another role. Um, I'm a Rotary Peace Activator, and, and that's a partnership with the Institute for Economics and Peace. And that really looks at the economic case for peace. Um, what does violence cost us? And what is the true meaning of when we create peace? So another great organization, and, and a shout out to them as well. 
So some of you, hopefully you can see this. I'm going to hold it up. Um, this is the crown. <laughs> some of you heard in my introduction that um, I'm Mrs. Canada. <laughs> that has everything to do with peace building. Um, I thought we should talk about the crown in the room. It's very hard to present with a virtual background because it disappears. Uh, I just wanted to hold it up for you. But part of my role as Mrs. Canada is to truly take the peace building platform to a new level and to truly bring meaning to it. And it started out as a bit of a joke. And so I was talking to the Institute for Economics and Peace during COVID, and we were talking about peace building and all the different platforms that we reach and how to reach them. And somebody said, well, what if you went into a pageant and you talked about world peace for real? And like many of you, maybe uh, the, the pandemic was a bit tough. I was feeling a bit caged in. And so with that opportunity, I got to fly to Vegas and I actually won. And so um, it was a bit funny for all of us to actually win, but I became Mrs. Canada on the platform of peace building. So for those of you who are interested in pictures of that, there's me getting crowned for the first time. Um, and then that stayed because of the pandemic. I got to be Mrs. Canada for a little while. So last June, I was giving away my crown and I was saying, thank you so much. It's been wonderful being your Mrs. Canada. Um, and much to everybody's surprise, including my own, I placed in the top 10 in the world. And so um, my platform has continued this real peace building platform that I'm trying to bring meaning to on a global scale as an Indigenous woman. So it is my pleasure to announce that I'm keeping the title of Mrs. Canada for 2023 and that I will be continuing on to the world stage um, as Mrs. Canada Globe 2023. And I was given the opportunity to actually take on a different title. And I thought if I'm going to compete at the global level, um, it was really important for me to situate, situate myself and where I'm from. I did ask them if I could be Mrs. Turtle Island so I could better represent our shared history across the continent. Um, that wasn't available. And so I am going to be Mrs. Canada. So for 2023, um, here I go again. So what I really want to get into now that you know lots about me and you've seen the pictures is, is the platform and, and the work that I do. Um, I'm going to give you a few examples and I'll show you some of the stuff I've done. And like I said, I really want to get to dialogue because I'm, I'm really interested in what everybody else is doing as well. So my belief is peace building is everyone every day. When I was younger, I believed that peace building was something bigger than me. I believed that I had to become a diplomat. I had to have a lot of formal training and that it was for a select few. Um, what I've learned over the years, especially working in community internationally, is peace building is all the things you do every single day. And we're going to get into some of those things. Um, but for me, this is the basis of every single thing that I do, whether it's as the community lead for anti-racism area at the city of Calgary or the consulting work I do with Indigenous relations or my platform is Mrs. Canada. I think that every single person matters and the actions that you take every single day matter. So when you choose to say hello to your neighbor, you choose to help somebody, you choose to know something that you didn't know before, that's everyday peace building. So we're also here to talk about truth and reconciliation in Canada. So we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive right now into some of the interesting headlines in Canada right now and some of the work that I've been up to with some of my colleagues who are on the call and some of my friends around the world. So Canada has managed to shock the world in some ways, and a lot of our elders um, have always told stories about children not coming home from residential school systems. And so a lot of our communities are not surprised, but the world has certainly been surprised on a global scale to see headlines like Canada's crying shame, the fields full of children's bones. And I can assure you that even within my own circle of friends, a lot of people just didn't know. They didn't know what happened during our residential school system. And our truth and reconciliation process has really brought a lot of things to light. So as we've uncovered this journey, we're gonna do a little bit of a timeline so you can see the journey that Canada has been on. Um, and we can parallel this to truth and reconciliation processes around the world. So if you've been part of some or you know of them, please feel free to populate the chat with that as well. I'll speak specifically to what I know about Canada, which is definitely not everything. So what's interesting is when we found the first of our children, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you some pictures of the site itself, the first one, um, 
it definitely shocked some Canadians and the world. And like I said, a lot of our elders um, were just waiting for the technology to be able to uh, translate the stories into a Western way of thinking, which is sometimes about quantifying. Um, and so one of the more recent headlines is expect more bodies to be found at residential school sites. So what we do know now is there's a lot more children that went to the school than what our report says, and there's a lot more that died at the school. And so we've heard numbers that, you know, maybe 3,000 children died at the school, maybe it was 6,000. And I know with, um, as we continue to look up a lot of the unmarked graves, we are finding a lot more of our children, and I know that we're up to 10,000. So what our former Truth and Reconciliation Chair says is that expect more. He said, if we continue looking, we may find 15 to 20,000 bodies. But he also goes on to say in the same article that we may never find all the children because some were thrown into rivers, some committed suicide, and some were burned in incinerators. And so this is, this is a tough conversation for Canada and for the world. And it's hard to imagine um, that this is a basis of our history. Um, so some of the other headlines, and like I said, a lot of Indigenous people um, are not surprised by these, and it is a relief to finally be able to talk about it and to bring more global conversation to it. But some of the more recent headlines when our Truth and Reconciliation report came out in 2015 was talking about our Indigenous schools as cultural genocide. And then another one reads, no, Canada committed regular genocide. And then the last one says residential schools were after all schools, not death camps or killing fields. Interesting headlines in 2015. So then we go a little bit back to where I just took us to saying we're finding bones of, of our children in these um, mass graves. So how did Canada get here? And we can ask the same question of many countries that have suffered through genocide um, or other terrors. But really and truly, when we start to look at what happened in Canada, um, a lot of it has to go back to the great European expansion and just over 500 years ago, where the Pope gave permission to conquer Indigenous people. So some of you may be familiar uh, with Terra Nullis, the idea that if you came to lands and savages were found, those lands could be considered empty. So Terra Nullis. And if those lands were empty, you could claim them as your own. Um, and so really, when we start to peel back Canada's history and the colonial constructs that exist, we really have to start to look back really far in history. So this timeline is likely a little bit small for you, but I encourage each of you to, to look at it because Sometimes we want to rush ahead, and it's quite popular right now for our elders to say reconciliation. We need to sit in truth as well, and that's part of what uh, Canada is grappling with right now: is that understanding what happened, getting action done, but also being able to sit in that truth and really discuss it and talk through it. Um, so, like I mentioned, it was the 1400s when we really had that edict from the Pope, which was also part of the doctrine of discovery and that whole papal bowl of Carinellis. And so that brings us all the way back there. And you can see points in this timeline where we go from the Royal Proclamation in 1763. Um, and you can start to see by 1953, we're relocating all Inuit people. We start to head into the 60s scoop by 1960s all the way to the 80s. Uh, my own family was subject to that. And that really um, was part of uh, removing children forcibly from their homes and putting them into the child welfare system. And then we actually get into you know, our constitution. We get into more of a royal commission looking into the effects of residential schools by 1996. By 2008, our prime minister at the time, Stephen Harper, is giving a formal apology. And by 2015, our Truth and Reconciliation Report is published. By 2019, we now have a missing and murdered Indigenous Women and Girls National Inquiry. So this shows a little brief timeline of Canada's history. But when we start to look at the constructs of what's created modern day Canada, when we start to look at the systems in place, you can imagine we, we have quite a bit of work to do. But I also know as a nation and as a people, we're strongly committed to doing better because we know better. And that being said, um, the legacy of the residential school system is haunting. And I know a lot of our elders and knowledge keepers are still not speaking up. 
Um, a lot of things happened in those schools. And so if you haven't been watching or listening in, um, some of the stories coming to light are, are just tremendous. And the resiliency of people and the ability to speak about it now is astounding to me. But one of the things I thought I'd help level set for everybody is what is truth and reconciliation? What does that actually mean here in the Canadian context? And I want to broaden that because what happened in Canada happened across the United States and even into a little bit further south. Because we look at the history of Turtle Island, we're all connected. And so this isn't a unique history to Canada alone. And while this conversation is specific to Canada, I'd encourage everybody to think broadly about um, Turtle Island as a whole. So our Truth and Reconciliation Commission looks at reconciliation. And for those of you who might think, well, what does that actually mean? Just think about relationship. And when we think about reconciliation, it's about that establishment and maintaining a mutually respectful relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal peoples in this country. So there's a little bit more around that. You can definitely find that more in our Truth and Reconciliation Report. And some of you might have noticed that this word and wording uses Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal. Our constitution from 1982 currently recognizes Indigenous peoples in Canada as Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal. So a lot of people still prefer to use that because that refers to our constitutional rights. Um, until our constitution is updated, um, we do not have a legal framework for Indigenous at this point. Um, and the same is, uh, if you heard the word Indian, we have an Indian Act that governs First Nations people. And so when you hear that, that's an important reference too to the legacies of our policies that still exist. So I promised that I would show you the site where we found the first of our 215 children. And some of you may have been here or be familiar with it. Tecumlips is the actual site name. And my mom is from here. And so I just want to acknowledge, too, that I walk a path of having a family that was involved in maintaining the residential school system and a family that was continually escaping to be part of it. So I had the chance um, when the first of the children were found to actually go to the, the school site. And this you can see a lot of the shoes are there. Um, but a lot of you might notice that in the background, there's children playing soccer. I don't know if you can see that. So we'll do a little bit of a close up here. And it was astounding to me because this was just a few months. The children had been found in May and this was by July. And so I had a chance to meet with the chief and I was asking her, you know, I, this is such a, an interesting thing. So if you look far in the distance, you can see a white small tent. That's where families are actively grieving and some of the, the sites where the bones um, have been found. And so then there's these children playing soccer, there's families gathering, and then there's the monument and the school itself. And I asked her, I said, why is this also activated? Why are children playing soccer? And the chief said to me, you know, Lorelai, as a nation, we made a choice. We decided early on that we would be the first to find the bones. She said, we really wanted to parallel Western ways of knowing with Indigenous ways of knowing. She said, in our community, there are many stories of children that never came home. But we recognized that we needed to actually maybe quantify this so that some of the stories could be brought to life for people that needed numbers. So she said, we worked really hard to fundraise. We worked really hard to get the technology. And she said, we made a plan. So we knew that when we found the children, we knew that we would close down and that we would mourn as a community. But she said, but after a certain amount of time, we would bring the community back. And we wanted the soccer field leased again. We wanted people to come to this space while there was mourning. She said, because what's really critical about this point in, of history is that we need to be both. We need to recognize the truth and sit in the pain and sorrow of what's happened, but we also need to see the shared path forward. We need to see what's possible, and our young generations are the people that are going to guide us through this. So she said it may seem difficult, but in the darkness, we also have to see the light, and that has definitely stayed with me, and it was one of the most powerful experiences of my life to witness this. So getting back to our headlines, um, it's interesting because remember the ones where I said that said it was cultural genocide? It was really important when the Pope came to Canada this past summer that he actually said 
Indigenous people suffered genocide at residential schools. That was really important for Indigenous peoples to hear. Um, it hasn't been written anywhere, and there's a whole bunch of stuff around that, but it was really important for the acknowledgement because cultural genocide tempers what happens. And it also tempers um, international things that might happen if you committed genocide. And so this was a really critical moment for us this past summer. And as you all know, likely uh, with the Queen passing on, um, it's been definitely uh, interesting dialogue here in Canada. The treaties are all signed with the Crown. And so that relationship with uh, Indigenous First Nations people who are on reserve and have treaty, um, that's with the Crown. And that, that's a lot bigger than our federal government. And so as we look at our complicated history and the Queen herself has passed on, she has been part of our entire system. You know, we looked at that timeline. She's been around for a lot of it. Um, but one of the things that has really stuck with me is one of our community members said at the end of the day, leaders are leaders and, and things happen while leaders are leading. But they said in our community, when someone passes, we honor that passing. They are a person. And so they said our nation at this point will not be commenting, but we will give respect to the passing of the queen. And then we will then talk to the king about what's next and the calls to action for reconciliation. So I thought that was a really amazing way to look at it. So some of the dialogue that I think that, you know, you're wondering what is truth and reconciliation in Canada? Here in Calgary and close to us is a city named Edmonton, if you're not familiar with the area. There's been lots of discussion. Our former mayor, Mayor Nenshi, um, talks about it in this particular city talk. Uh, article and there's a video associated with it but he talks about you know how uncomfortable it is and he talks about you know you can't just lump things together you can't say truth and reconciliation is anti-racism and he talks a lot about this being the pointy edge of reconciliation and in this particular article he talks about this being an important important moment for Canada to acknowledge the worst part of what we have been and so I think as Canadians um a lot of us are taking time in this moment in history just to make sure we don't rush over what happened, to make sure that we pay tribute, and then to make sure that we're moving forward in a good way. This is something that I saw online, and I apologize because I couldn't find the credit for it. I just keep finding the memes for it. But to me, this is what spoke to me, and it speaks to the work that I do, and it may speak to many of you. But it says, the children they took and tried to silence are the very ones that have awakened the world. And to me, this is incredibly powerful because a lot of the elders say that the children's bones were ready to be found. The children spoke and then they have awoken the world with this story of what has actually happened to indigenous children across Turtle Island. And so this is really poignant. I was, when I was talking to the staff at the Tecumlips Residential School, the one I showed you the picture of, they said that the day that the bones were uh, uncovered and they, they started looking into stuff and they were, you know, figuring out how what they would say to the world, that the sound of tiny little feet were all across the school all day. But they said it was like a pitter patter of, of children saying, thank you, thank you, we're ready to speak. And to me, that's why this meme or this um this thing that was online has really spoken to me because it talks about the bravery that's required and how sometimes by saying nothing, um, you can awaken the world. So this is one of my favorite Canadian uh, corporate training programs. Um, you don't just need it if you're a corporation, but I strongly recommend everybody um, look at this company. Bob Joseph is the founder. He's written an incredible book called 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act. And they have so many great things on their blog site and they have a newsletter. I don't work for them, so this isn't a, a plug. But they have this great little part that talks about what reconciliation is not. And um, I appreciate this because it's like, it's not a trend. It's not a single gesture, action or statement. It's not a box to be ticked. It's not about blame. It's not about guilt. It's not about the loss of rights for Indigenous Canadians, and it's not like someone else's job. And so I think those are really thing, important things as we think about how we act during this important moment in history across the globe. 
And they also have this great checklist that I found really important. Um, and so asking yourself questions like, you know, that self-check, do I understand the generational impact of residential schools? And I'll extend that to Turtle Island. And, and I know in Europe, there has been some circumstances that could be paralleled. And so I'm just gonna leave that to how it applies to you. But this little thing goes through, you know, do you know the calls to action? Do you know how to react to uncivil dialogue? And we're gonna get to that. And then do you know what the impacts of cultural appropriation is? Um, do you understand the difference between empathy and sympathy? And I myself refer back to this because you can get really caught up emotionally in, in who you are as a person, but you can also get like, am I still growing through this? Um, for me personally, I always ask, am I teaching my children? Are they taking the next action? And are we doing even more? So one of the things um, you might say, everyday peace building, how do I actually do that, Lorelai? So um, some of you are doing great things around the world and I've seen a little few things popping up in the chat about it. One of the things I've been working on in conjunction with the NISPA nation in British Columbia and with Rotary is peace conversations. So how do we actually have hard dialogues? Um, and so this is just a little, from the program that we've done, but looking at what a peace conversation is. And I do have to give credit to Scott Martin. He was actually part of developing this um, as part of his work as a Rotary Peace Fellow. And this is part of the work that I do with Mediators Beyond Borders. So we actually learn together how to have structured conversations. We learn to listen and learn, embrace differences. And many of you on the call will appreciate this. It's an indirect way to address conflict in our community. And I would say also in our families, and it's a useful skill set, and it does say where you can use at home. So one of my learnings that I, I want to share is I hadn't worked with the Niska Nation, and so um, I'm Indigenous, but I am not Niska, and so I had the chance to actually look at, you know, how do we actually do peace conversations in this context with this community? And this is one of the parallel teachings they gave us to share. Um, it's Sai Kilimgat, and it's one heart, one path, one nation, and it's referred to also as the common bowl. So how we act matters because we all eat out of the same common bowl. If we don't act like it matters for seven generations, then we are not looking to the good of the people who are going to follow us and the people who came before us. And so some of the teachings that I carry that I just want to briefly share in my peace building, and I encourage each of you to think, you know, how might this parallel to you? Because I think sometimes we get caught up in peace building or in track one, track two peace processes, if you're part of any of that, and we start to think this is the way. Well, the beautiful part is I've got to bring some of my own culture and identity and some of my teachings to all the work that I've been doing. And one of them is the seven sacred teachings or the seven grandfather teachings. This is this is not the same for all Indigenous people, but it is um, one of the more commonalities here in Tur Turtle Island. For me personally, this is my own culture, being Métis. Um, we have a few things that I wanted to share if you want to look them up, but we have our 12 Métis values. We have our sash, which you can see me wearing, and there's a lot of metaphor in the weaving of this, the colors, the symbolism, um, the re reclamation of it as a national symbol for us all. Um, and then below you see our infinity symbol. And that's really important because for us as Métis people, it symbolizes two cultures coming together forever. So I will forever have European roots and indigenous roots. And the most beautiful teaching that I've received out of it is that I don't have to pick. I get to be both of it. I get to be indigenous and I get to be European and I get to walk with the foot in both worlds. And that means that I get to have that amplified. I don't actually have to pick between either of them. So one of the things um, I'm going to be working in the spring a little bit more um, around this, but the Haudenosaunee Constitution speaks to the welfare of the whole and the coming generation. So I think, you know, these are the types of principles that um, we're starting to speak to in the peace building work that I've been part of. And I know um, some of these principles are shared cross-culturally. So if you have anything to share, again, please put in the chat or save it for the questions. One of the most critical things I've learned in peace building, if I can offer an everyday peace building tip, is don't assume. Um, sometimes cross-culturally, we don't always understand. We, we don't live there. We don't know. And this was from a teaching from one of the elders. And they said, when I nod, when I'm listening to you, it doesn't mean I'm agreeing with you. 
it means I understand what you're saying. And so that's one of the things I've really thought about for a long time is how often do I make assumptions when I'm out there in the world working cross-culturally and I forget to listen more or to ask more and to find out what does that actually mean? So this is a few little pictures coming up now to show you what peace building has looked like for me in the last 20 years. Um, I think a lot of the hard work um, in the even in the more formalized peace processes, this is one of them um, in the Philippines, in Mindanao that I had a chance to work on. And a lot of the actual work happened in these community tables where we actually sat together and we shared food. Some of the peace building I've done have has looked like this, where we've actually had some dialogue overlooking some of the nation's land and actually having really hard conversations about what is the vision? How do we want to get through this? Some of the peace processes have looked like this. There's been women's drumming. There's been walks to end polio. And always for me, um, all the peace building I do always comes back to the land. And many of you may feel that. We started with a, a land acknowledgement, thinking about where we are. And a lot of what we need to work through is really just about going back to the land and thinking about the connections. We're not separate. We're not separate from each other and we're not separate from the land. And when I say the land, somebody asked me this the other day, I mean the water and the air and the earth itself. Um, so for me, land is all encompassing. And when I think about peace processes and I think about the little girl who thought she'd be a diplomat, none of my work has actually happened in very formal buildings with skyscraper type looking elements. They've happened in community buildings like this. And I don't know if any of you can relate, but these are all the types of community settings in a brief overview where I have been part of what has been some of the most tremendous peace building that I've witnessed. So one of the things, and this is where we'll start to wrap up, and I'm just going to tell you some of the things I've been working on. So some of you might say, well, what else are you doing, Lorelai, besides doing these presentations and, and connecting with people? I've started to write because um, some of what I've been taught hasn't necessarily been written. There's a lot of oral history um, with my own teachers. And so I've been working with some of them to actually publish some of this. So it's really exciting because some of this is just coming out. So we have a brand new chapter in a book called Leadership and Virtues. Me and one of my greatest mentors, Dr. Mike Lickers, challenge the idea of virtues and actually talk about the original teachings within this book. We'll pre be presenting in California next month on this. Um, I've collaborated with some people in the United States around um, peace education and our violent past. You can see that one there. And I've also just on my own published a chapter on peace leadership and indigenous ways of knowing. So I've started to try to document with credence to the teachings that I've been given and the elders and knowledge keepers so that there can be um, some of this in the academic world if it's needed. The other thing is I've been trying to find spaces where we aren't having these conversations. So I was approached by um, one of the accounting associations here and they said, could you write um, about the footprints of the original peoples of Canada? And so this is a recent article in one of the accounting magazines. So if you're an accountant or you read accounting materials, you can see some of my work there. Um, and this is another thing that's super exciting that I really want to share with everybody. And I, I could see there's probably some links we can make, but me and my friend Julia, we put in a proposal to the International Development Research Center here in Canada, so with the federal government, and it was for the Women, Peace and Security Research Award. And they said, we don't normally give it to anybody in Turtle Island. It's usually given out there because we want to help out there and we don't necessarily find this research um, instrumental to hear. And they said, but your project, which we called the Power to Protect, Climate Change, Intersectional Environmentalism, and the Leadership of Indigenous Women, they said it's so timely. And so uh, Julie and I are just beginning this project, so I'd love to connect with people more about it. At the heart of our project is storytelling, and we're really going to be sitting with um, female leaders in particular to talk about the land, to talk about stories, and to talk about peace building from a female leadership and to reevaluate how we view conflict. Because sometimes we think we only have to respond to conflict if there's violence or if there's arms involved. 
And we're looking at things like domestic violence. Um, we're looking at microaggressions. We're looking at things where females in particular experience conflict, but we're also looking at the leadership that women have played historically, especially indigenous women, and the role that we have to play and the knowledge that we have to share with the world. So as we wrap up here and I show you a few little things I'm working on, one of the things I want you to consider um, is that sometimes we think, you know, it's quiet, you know, we're going to go find our inner peace and we're going to go up a mountain. But I love this quote because it says, you keep pairing me with quiet, he said, but my true companion is the mighty clamor of chains being ripped clean from the wall. And sometimes peace has to be loud and it has to be all of us coming together with voices and speaking up. And so that's been part of my platform as Mrs. Canada is to, I have a microphone and so I want to speak up about what does peace need? What's required? So this will just flip through a few little things where I've been loud in spaces. And if you've had enough of Lorelei, I apologize for these next few slides. But this is an article in the Rotary Magazine um, where I was featured as uh, a grassroots ambassador, a grassroots diplomat with an Indigenous heritage. So for me, that was pretty exciting. Um, this was a recent thing. I got to present uh, Trails to Peace in Utah and actually talk about what's required for peace building. Some of you may recognize um, this beautiful lady that I'm with. And uh, uh, if you don't, you can put it in the chat. We'll play a game. We'll see if you recognize her. I won't tell you quite yet who that is. Um, and then you were probably wondering more like, do you have kids or what else happens in your life? I do. I have a son and a daughter and they are little peace builders. They are out there every single day. And I wanted to share this with you. We took Christmas to visit the Philippines. Uh, my uncle's living there, um, but to really just spend time in community. And so we decided to spend our Christmas presents that we'd normally buy each other, just giving to the community. And so we made sure every person in this barangay actually had rice and fresh vegetables on New Year's Eve. And so there you can see my daughter and you can see um, we were able to visit everybody with the Mrs. Canada crown and this little tricycle and we delivered to everybody in the community and just really spent time with everybody and just understanding current situation and, and building relationships. We also decided that the kids would use all of their allowance for the year to get Lego and our neighbors contributed, but this was donated to the schools. And so latching onto that brick by brick change um, and bringing things that the children normally wouldn't have access to, including um, building bricks for Lego and getting them distributed uh, where they were wanted into the, into the schools. So here's a few more little things, just some radio stuff I've been on, um, a global peace conference, um, newsletters. Um, you may have seen me in some of these things. And one of the biggest things that I'm super proud of is my own nation, the Métis Nation here in Alberta. We have been fighting for constitutional rights. And so as an Indigenous person, um, it's been something we've really been looking forward to. And this year we were able to ratify it. And so we are looking at a nation to nation relationship with the federal government here in Canada for the first time. So I'm really proud to be part of this. Um, these are just a few more little conferences coming up in the next bit. And the last thing I want to encourage you is you don't have to make headlines to do this stuff. You don't have to wear a crown. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine this. Um, but when I see things like Mrs. Globe Canada brings community building message to Kamloops, which is where I mentioned my mom's from, I just want to encourage each of you. Somebody really wise said once to me, wiggle where you are. So whether you have a microphone, a crown, uh, anything, it doesn't have to be any of those things. Figure out the difference that you can make. Um, figure out how you can use what you have and challenge yourself. I um, never imagined that I would get this opportunity and I have just tried to make the most of it. Um, I have tried to reinvent the space that I've been put into. It's a US-based colonial type pageant system and they've been very hesitant on me. But this past weekend here in Calgary, I had the chance to be honored with uh, a sweater from the Indigenous community that they put on it in DigiQueen. And so the pageant itself has been very open to me showing up as an Indigenous person. Um, sometimes they want me to wear high heels and I'm wearing moccasins and we agree to disagree. 
But I wanted to show you this to show you that whatever space you're in is don't be afraid to claim it. Don't be afraid to show up as who you are and don't be afraid to change the rules. And the reason I say that, and we're going to come back as we close now to my grandmother, Delia, is she never imagined a time where she could practice her culture, let alone share her bannock recipe. And so this was a headline, Mrs. Canada destined to share her Métis pride. She never imagined that she'd have a granddaughter that would do that. I didn't know that either. Um, I just happened to have the opportunity. And I know that I have changed our generational story. My father was extremely, extremely ashamed to be Indigenous. And for the first time, a few years ago, he got his card. So he is now a Métis Nation member. And he's talking about things in a new way. And he's telling me stories that he's never told me. And it just takes one person in a family to finally say, I'm tired of living in shame. I'm tired of living in guilt. And I want to own my history. I want to ask the hard questions. And so I feel privileged that I got to be the person to be that person in my family. And if I haven't said it enough, we're all required. Whether you're Indigenous or not, or don't know, the shared path forward needs all of us. This particular picture is my children and their cousin on the steps of the residential school in Tecumloops or Tanloops. And I never imagined a day that they would stand on these steps and that we would have an entire generation that is absolutely standing up saying this will never happen. And so these are our little leaders and they're so proud to be Métis. Um, they are really adamant that, especially in Canada here, that we will never have anything like this happen again. And it makes me super proud to know that um, they're so inspired. So here's where you can find me. We'll make sure that you have all of this. Actually, this slide is outdated now that I've made my big announcement about 2023. So we'll make sure you have the updated information. Um, but with that, I just wanted to say, Marcy, thank you. It is tremendous for all of you to take time out of your day to hear my story, but to also hear about truth and reconciliation here in Canada. And I just want to thank each of you for joining us. And I am so looking forward to your questions and to just hearing more about what you're up to. So Marcy, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lorelai. I, I think I speak for all of us when, when I say that that was a truly inspiring, informative, um, and just incredible presentation. So thank you so much for sharing your story and also your work, your incredibly important work that you're currently doing. Um, as you may have noticed, folks who are tuning in, Lorelai wears many hats. So we really encourage you to uh, ask questions in the chat about you know, the subjects that Lorelai was just beautifully presenting on. Um, but to sort of get, uh, get the ball rolling, I do have an initial question that I'll kick us off with here. Um, and again, please feel free to, to write your questions in the chat. Thank you again, Lorelai. Uh, the first question that, I, that I'd like to ask here is sort of um, based on the fact that, you know, World Beyond War audience, audiences are usually tuned into the geopolitical conflicts and, and wars that are so often dominating our, our news feeds and, and our headlines and all those, all those things. So I was wondering if you'd like to speak a little bit to, you know, with that being said, what is the value of everyday peace building in a time when geopolitical conflict and war really seems to take center stage in, in popular peace related discourse? Thanks, Maya. That's a great question. And I think it's that, you know, the drop in the bucket. And so sometimes probably a lot of us feel like we're out there and we're waving the peace flag or we're saying don't invest in that. And being part of initiatives that are trying to help build that case for peace and positive peace, it can be hard, but uh, we're all drops. And so even just on this call alone, I think collectively we have a lot of power. Systems are made of people. We are those people. And it's really hard to imagine that we're gonna make the shift, but other shifts have been made and it has taken a tremendous amount of effort um, and some real game changers. I think one of the wisest things around this that I heard is I was part of a leadership program here in Canada 
and it was with the governor general. And they said, you know, the problem is a lot of you aren't running for leadership. You know, it's a scary place and it's hard to be there. And none of you are actually, you're going on this leadership thing and none of you are taking on those formal leadership roles that are required. And so if I can offer one word of inspiration is if you feel so inclined, um, take on those leadership roles, big or small, and don't lose a network. Don't do it alone. Um, we definitely need all of us. And while the predominant dialogue out there is very loud, I think all of us on this call know the power of social media and how a movement can sweep. And I think about to come loops and how they knew they knew that if they just kept investing in technology and they knew that if they were just patient, that they would eventually find the first remains of the children. And that would speak volumes in a way that it doesn't matter how loudly they shouted. They just needed the children to literally speak. So like I said, um, the children spoke softly, but they woke a world with that. So that's just kind of my reflections. 100%. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing that very eloquent response. And I'm going to highlight another question that's coming up here in the chat. Um, we have somebody named Wynn who's tuning in. Um, and Wynn asks, should the federal government have invited First Nations into the healthcare conversations that are currently ongoing in Canada? So sort of different type of question for you there. Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. And I'd love for other people to weigh in too. Um, Here's the thing is when treaties were negotiated, there were certain things that were negotiated and certain things that were not. And so not being First Nations, I'm not subject to some of those conversations and some of those. So I can only offer my perspective as a Métis person. I believe strongly that nothing should be for you or about you without you. And so a lot of the agreements that are in place, um, especially if you're First Nations and you fall under the Indian Act, you're treated as a ward of the state. And it even says that in the act. And so I think the more conversations that can happen and people can direct their own destiny and have a chance to define success, I think is really important. And so I'll just add, you know, our Métis Nation here in Alberta, creating a constitution puts us in that bargaining space, which we've never been able to be in here in Alberta uh, without a constitution. And so I can honestly say we haven't actively been engaged in some conversations because we didn't have that ability. And so um, I think a dialogue is always important. And I think that um, the more we dialogue, the more we can start to understand where the system is holding things back or where we need to push a little bit harder. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and that actually leads right into the next question that I wanted to ask you, which was about this, this movement that you're a part of right now to, to, you know, to foster a nation to nation relationship between the Métis Nation and, and Alberta and Canada at large. Um, so I was wondering if you wanted to speak a bit more to that. What, what has it been like to be a part of that movement? Obviously you've been around the world on, on, peace building projects, but this is, you know, this is home, this is close to home, peace building at home. So I'd love to hear a bit more, a bit more about that experience. Some of the, some of the highlights, lowlights. Yeah. Thank and you. yeah, thank you, Maya. And there's so many people who have been part of this. I mean, I'm just a tiny piece. So I want to give a lot of credit to a lot of people who have been part of this and some have passed on. Um, we have had a complicated system as Métis people in Canada, really unique and distinct and Inuit or First Nations. So I'll just speak to the experience, you know, as a Métis person, we were subject to script. And so many of us were given little pieces of paper with the promise of land. Our, our lawyer describes it as the largest land swindle in the history of Canada because the Canadian government bargained with Métis people one-on-one. -on -one. And so they said, you can have this piece of land and just sign here and well, there's your piece of paper. Um, we weren't part of the larger treaty negotiations. And, and I'll just temper that by saying, some people say we signed as other Indians. So there's a wide array of perspectives. So I'm just, I'm speaking, you know, from my experience here um, with our nation and, and the dialogue we've been having. And so that being said, um, what I will tell you is I was given script. I have a little piece of paper in my family thing that says we own this land. What happened, fast forward years and years later, my dad was renting 
an apartment on the very land that my piece of paper says we own. And it was it was through the generations taken away from our family, and my dad was renting this apartment. And to this day, um, there's been a reclamation of that settlement. It's called Rooster Town in Winnipeg. But there's a lot of court cases now at play because there was, you know, this land swindle that happened and promises, and then just kind of like, no. That being said, here in Alberta, we still have eight Métis settlements. And so some people are part of those formal settlements. I was not part of them, so can't speak to that. But I was one of the families who was given script that was never um, seen to fruition. So um, Maya, your question was more about what is it like? Um, I have never been more proud in my life to be who I am. I It's been amazing. Um, it's been interesting to start to see where there's differences um, with Métis people here in Alberta and others. Um, for example, uh, I was looking into getting, you know, can I gather traditional medicines? Can I hunt? Like, what are my hunting rates? And right now, because we're a society, or we were, um, we have very limited sort of nation to nation rights. And so we have to be able to prove that we've hunted on this land for X amount of time in order to hunt here. And we don't have bargaining power to say, but we've lived here the last whatever. Why can't we exercise our hunting rights or our gathering rights? So those are the kinds of things. Um, we face that in the healthcare area too. And so we haven't been able to advocate for us as a people, as a distinct nation. Um, we have been, and I'm going to say some words that may be hard for some to hear. We have been called half-breeds. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that what a constitution does for us is it sets us into a really distinct nation status and a recognition that we have rights and roots that lead back to the 17 and 1800s across Canada. So it's pretty huge for our nation. A quote I'll share that may inspire others, but one of our leaders, Louis Riel, he was hung for treason by the Canadian government. Um, he said that um, he said, my people will sleep for a hundred years. And I'm going to paraphrase here. He said, but after that, they will awaken and it's the artists who will, who will lead the way. And so I think when he said artists, he meant the people that can weave, the people that can understand things from both sides, much like our sash, but find a way forward for a shared path. And it's been just over a hundred years since Louis Rell said that. And I feel like in my own nation, there's been an awakening and a people ready to share and to to see those gaps and to help bridge them and um i can honestly say it's an incredible time to see my nation waking up wow that's an incredibly beautiful sentiment and what a prophecy <laughs> that's that's quite incredible and beautiful to hear about your work that you're doing uh, with your nation um to 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 make their be a, a real nation to nation relationship, which is obviously critical um, for, for the well being of all involved. So, thank you for that important work and thank you for articulating that here this evening. And I just wanted to mention that also we're getting a lot of positive feedback um, in the chat from people who are who are really grateful for your presentation and for sharing, um, especially there was there was an individual here that mentioned the discussion in your presentation of the soccer players and, and the grieving tent. Uh, between you and the chief was very helpful for them um, to understanding the reality on the ground there. Um, I did want to bring it to to another question here, um, which is sort of uh, perhaps the elephant in the room sometimes when we talk about truth and reconciliation, is that for a lot of people, you know, reconciliation is not something that they see as feasible or alive or or whatever it may be. So what do you say to those, you know, both indigenous and non-indigenous who say, you know, enough dialogue, discussion, negotiate, negotiation. What is your response to those who say that, that reconciliation is, is dead? Mm. Yeah, I hear it too. <laughs> I know a lot of people always try to shock me. I'm like, oh, I've heard that. A parallel use that may be applicable for those of you who may be from Europe or work there. Um, when I was working in Poland, uh, we were cleaning up the Byzantine river, river system and um, one of the things was Majdanek, which is the second largest concentration camp in the world. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's a big sign that's over the city and it, it kind of just hangs out there. And I was asking them, like, why do you keep that sign up? And they said, so that we never forget, so that we never once um, don't look up and see that sign and remind us we never want to go back to that. 
And that was powerful to me because in learning more about Canada's history, um, when the when Auschwitz was being created, uh, people came to Canada to see some of the extermination methods. And so they were replicated in Auschwitz, some of the incinerators. Um, and then when South Africa was creating apartheid, they came to Canada to see how we separated Indigenous peoples with the reserve system. So apartheid ended in South Africa in 1994, and our last uh, residential school closed in 1996. So when people say to me, you know, reconciliation is not a thing and we've done it, I think about all the history learnings across the world and the reminders that we have that we can't just tear things down and say, yeah, we dealt with that. It's really important that we have living reminders and we continue to act because if not, we could, we could go back. We could do terrible things to one another again. And we haven't learned the lesson as humanity. And so if people believe that reconciliation is dead, I do fear about that type of leadership. And so I'd encourage people who are excited and wanting to take on a different kind of leadership that we do need to be a little bit louder about our leadership in the world. Thank you so much for that incredibly powerful comparison. Um, I'm seeing again, more positive reactions in the chat. I could say my own positive reactions to your to your words, but I wanna pass along the things that are, that are being said in the chat. Um, again, very powerful uh, comparison here. And I think with that, um, seeing the questions sort of slow down, um, the ones that are being sent to me and otherwise. So I think with that, we'll sort of naturally let this, let this beautiful presentation come to a close. Um, thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts, Lorelai, for your beautiful presentation this evening and the incredibly important work that you, that you continue to do. Um, it's truly inspired me and I think many others this evening. Thank you all for joining us. We'll be sure to send out a recording um, of this presentation and some of the important notes that Lorelai uh, mentioned this evening. Um, and with that, we, we bid you good night. Thank you all so much for joining us. Lorelai, feel free to chime in with anything else. Yeah, Marcy, thank you everybody. And I just wanna thank you all for the love and encouragement and we have to do this work together. And so what, what a powerful community and let's keep going. <laughs> let's do this. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Thank you.